Hello everyone, so I've got some last minute revision for MRCOG part two. Um, this is absolutely essential stuff that you must know before sitting your exam. Please like, uh, comment and subscribe to my channel. Um, so it encourages me to do more. Um, and also you can keep yourself updated with any more revision material that I post. So um, nice guidelines for um, GTT, which is the glucose tolerance test. So for anybody who's got any of these risk factors, uh, NICE recommends that um, you must um, offer a GTT to this patient. So BMI above 30, previous macrosomic baby, that's baby over 4.5 kilos, previous gestational diabetes, family history of diabetes, or first degree relative with diabetes, and ethnicity with a high prevalence of diabetes. Diagnosing gestational diabetes, so fasting plasma glucose level of 5.6 millimoles per litre or above, or two hour plasma glucose level of 7.8 millimoles per litre or above. Gestational diabetes, so fasting plasma level of glucose level of seven or more, um, if, if that's at diagnosis, then immediate treatment with insulin, with or without metformin and diet and exercise changes. For GDM, um, so that's gestational diabetes mellitus, if the fasting plasma glucose is between 6 and 6.9 and um, there are complications like macrosomia and polyhydramnios, then consider immediate treatment with insulin with or without metformin and diet and exercise changes. So, um, advice for pregnant women to, uh, with diabetes to maintain their uh, plasma glucose. So fasting is 5.3 millimoles per litre and one hour after meal is 7.8 millimoles per litre or two hours after meal, which is 6.4 millimoles per litre. So timing of delivery. So advise women with gestational diabetes um, to give birth no later than 40 plus six days, uh, offer induction of labor or cesarean section, elective birth before 40 plus six days for GDM with maternal or fetal complications. Postnatally, uh, blood glucose testing should be done for the baby at two to four hours after birth Fasting plasma glucose test um, should be done um, 6 to 13 weeks postnatally um, to exclude diabetes. Uh, this is for the, for the women. Um, offer an annual HbA1c test for gestational diabetes uh, for women who have a negative postnatal um, test for diabetes. So it's um, 6 to 13 weeks it is, is fasting plasma glucose and then annual HbA1c if that fasting plasma glucose is, um, is, is, is normal. The World Health Organization uh, parameters for semen analysis, semen volume of 1.5 mL or more, pH 7.2 or more, sperm concentration 15 million spermatozoa per mL or more, um, total sperm number 39 million spermatozoa per ejaculate or more, total motility, um, so per, a percentage of progressive motility and non-progressive motility, 40% or more motile or 32% or, percent or more with progressive motility. Vitality, 58% or more live spermatozoa, sperm morphology, 4% um, or more. High risk of preeclampsia. So if patients got high risk of preeclampsia, then uh, you advise um, for them to take 75 to 150 milligrams of aspirin daily from 12 weeks until the birth of baby. Um, women at high risk are those who have hypertensive disease during a previous pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease such as systemic lupus erythematosus or antiphospholipid syndrome, type 1 or type 2 diabetes and chronic hypertension. And this is from the NICE guidance. If there is more than one moderate risk factor uh, for preeclampsia, then again, the advice is to take 75 to 150 milligrams of aspirin once a day from 12 weeks until the birth of baby. Um, and the moderate risk factors are things like first pregnancy, age 40 or over, pregnancy interval of more than 10 years, 
BMI of 35 or more, um, family history of preeclampsia or multiple pregnancies, so things so like twins. So you've got a table uh, on management of pregnancy uh, with gestational hypertension. Um, so you have the hypertension level uh, divided uh, into two. So it's either 140, 90 uh, to 159, 109 or severe hypertension, which is over 160, 110. So, um, so for the first category, which is 140, 90, 159, 109, uh, do not routinely admit to hospital of a pharmacological uh, treatment if BP remains over 140, over 90. Aim for blood pressure of 135, 85 uh, or less on treatment. Um, so blood pressure measurement is uh, advised once or twice uh, a, a week. Um, until blood pressure is in the range of 135, 85 or less. Urine dipstick uh, once or twice a week. Uh, blood test, measure full blood count, liver function test and renal function test um, at presentation and then weekly. Um, for PIGF testing, carry out PIGF testing based uh, um, based on based, um, testing on um, at least one occasion. Fetal assessment of a fetal heart auscultation at every antenatal appointment. Um, carry out ultrasound uh, assessment of the fetus at diagnosis, and if normal, then repeat every two to four weeks if clinically indicated. Carry out a CTG only if clinically indicated. For severe hypertension, that's blood pressure over 160, 110, uh, admit, um, but if blood pressure falls um, less than 160, 110, um, then manage uh, as for hypertension. So offer pharmacological treatment to all women, um, aim for blood pressure of 135, 85 uh, or less, every uh, so measure blood pressure over 15 to 30 minutes until blood pressure is less than 160 over 110. Uh, urine dipstick should be done daily while admitted, um, measure full blood count, a liver function test, renal function test at presentation and then weekly, carry out PIGF based testing on one uh, occasion of a fetal heart auscultation to every antenatal appointment, carry out uh, ultrasound assessment of the fetus in a, a diagnosis, and if uh, normal, then repeat every two weeks if uh, severe hypertension persists. Carry out at uh, a CTG at diagnosis, and then only if clinically indicated. So there's a similar table for management of pregnancy with preeclampsia. So again, it divides it into two uh, blood pressure ranges. So blood pressure of 140 over 90 to 159 or 109, or severe hypertension, which is blood pressure of 160 over 110 or more. So, um, so for, the, for the first category, that's blood pressure of 140 over 90 to 159 over 109. Um, so admission, so admit if any clinical concerns uh, for the well-being of the woman or baby. Um, offer pharmacological treatment if BP, if BP remains over above 140-90, um, aim for blood pressure 135 over 85 or less on treatment at least. Um, so blood pressure measurement should be done at least every 48 hours and more frequently if the woman is admitted to hospital. Um, urine dipstick testing only repeat if clinically indicated, for example, if new symptoms and signs develop or there is um, uncertainty over diagnosis. Blood test, um, measure full blood count, liver function test and renal function test twice a week. Um, fetal assessment, so offer fetal heart auscultation at every antenatal appointment. Carry out um, ultrasound assess assessment of the fetus um, at diagnosis and if normal, repeat every two weeks. Carry out a CTG at diagnosis and then only if clinically indicated. For severe hypertension, so that's hypertension of above 160 over 110 or more, admit, but if BP falls below 160 over 110, then manage as for, as for hypertension. So offer pharmacological treatment, aim for blood pressure 135 over 85 on treatment, um, measure blood pressure every 15 to 30 minutes until blood pressure is less than 160 over 110, then at least four times um, daily when um, the women is an inpatient, uh, depending on clinical circumstances. Um, urine dipstick only repeat if clinically indicated, for example, if there's new symptoms and signs develop or if there's uncertainty over diagnosis. Blood test, measure full blood count, liver function test and renal function test three times a week. Offer fetal heart auscultation at every um, antenatal appointment, carry out ultrasound assessment of the fetus at diagnosis and if normal, repeat every two weeks carry out a CTG diagnosis and then only if clinical indicated. So 
Now, you, mu you all must be doing different things at your local trust. It's very important to forget all that uh, in the exam and do what the table is telling you because this is from the guidelines and the exam markings um, will be based from the guidelines. So not what you um, do at your local trust. That's a very important thing that you should remember for the MRCOG part two and three exam, which is that your clinical experience, yes, is, it's very helpful, but to answer the question in the exam, you have to follow what the guidelines say. So clinical criteria for choice of critical care beds. So um, for level one um, care, um, it's just somebody with preeclampsia with hypertension, ongoing conservative antenatal management of severe preterm um, hypertension, step down treatment after the birth. For level two care, step down uh, from level three or severe preeclampsia with any of the following complications. So eclampsia, health syndrome, hemorrhage, hyperkalemia, severe oligouria, coagulation support, intravenous antihypertensive treatment, initial stabilization of severe hypertension, evidence of cardiac failure, abnormal neurology, and level three care is for severe preeclampsia and needing ventilation. So the likelihood of recurrence of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So you've got type of hypertension in previous or current pregnancy, and then prevalence of hypertensive disorders in a future pregnancy. So if you have any hypertensive disorders in a pregnancy, whether it's current or previous, then your risk of having any um, future hypertension problems in a pregnancy is approximately 21%. If you had any preeclampsia, um, then your risk of having it again is approximately 20%. If you had a gestational hypertension or have it in a current pregnancy, then your risk of having it again is approximately 22%. Uh, again, your risk, so if you've got uh, any hypertensive uh, disorder in this pregnancy, your risk of having preeclampsia uh, in the future is for, in, in, in a future pregnancy is 14%. If you have preeclampsia in this pregnancy or any other pregnancy or previous pregnancy, your risk of having it again is 16%. Um, but if birth was at 28 to 34 weeks, then uh, the risk is 33%, so quite high. If birth was at 34 to 37 weeks, then the risk is 23%. Um, gestational hypertension, so if you've got any history of gestational hypertension, then your risk in the future of developing preeclampsia is 7%. Um, again, any hypertensive disorders, um, risk of developing gestational hypertension is 9%. With preeclampsia, the, the risk of gestational hypertension is between 6 and 12%. With gestational hypertension, the risk of developing future gestational hypertension is the risk is between 11 and 15%. Um, if there is preeclampsia in any pregnancy, the risk of developing any chronic hypertension is approximately 2%. That's one in 50 women. If you had any gestational hypertension in, in any pregnancy, the risk of developing chronic hypertension in the future is approximately 3%. Cardiovascular risk in women who have had hypertensive disorders. Uh, so this table looks at type of hypertension in current or previous pregnancy. Uh, so things like preeclampsia, any hypertension disorder, gestational hypertension or chronic hypertension, and then looks at risk of future cardiovascular um, disease. So if you had any hypertension in, 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 in a in a pregnancy, uh, whether it's current or uh, or previous, your m risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event uh, is increased uh, up to approximately two times. If you had preeclampsia, the risk is between 1.5 to three times. If you had gestational hypertension, the risk is again increased by 1.5 to three times. If you had chronic hypertension um, in a pregnancy, then the risk of having a major adverse cardiovascular event is increased again by 1.7 times. If you had any hypertensive disorder in, 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 the, in a pregnancy, the risk of having cardiovascular mortality is increased by two times. Uh, if you had preeclampsia, the risk of mortality increases by two times again. Uh, if you had any hypertensive disorder in a pregnancy, the risk of stroke goes up by 1.5 uh, times. Uh, the pre if you have preeclampsia, the risk of stroke goes up between two and three times. Um, with gestational hypertension, the risk of stroke may be increased. With chronic hypertension, the risk is definitely increased by 1.8 times. Um, 
Again, if there's any hypertension disorder in the pregnancy, the risk of having future hypertension is between two and four times. With preeclampsia, the risk is between two and five times. With gestational hypertension, the, the, the risk of future hypertension is between two and four times. Um, so quite important tables, as you can see. They've got very important numbers that um, can easily uh, come up in a form of a, a SBU or an EMQ question. Gestational trophoblastic disease, so incidence in the UK is 1 in 714 live births. Um, vaginal bleeding is the most common pre presenting symptom of molar pregnancy and is approximately associated with 60% of presentation. For This is a very important slide because it talks about follow-up for uh, molar pregnancy. So for complete molar pregnancy, if the HCG has reverted to normal within 56 days of a pregnancy event, then follow-up will be for six months from the date of uterine removal. If HCG has not reverted to normal within 56 day, days of a pregnancy, um, then follow-up will, will be um, will be four six months from normalization of the HCG level. Um, Follow-up for partial molar pregnancy is concluded once the HCG has returned to normal on two samples at least four weeks apart. Women who have not received chemotherapy um, do not need any um, HCG measurement in any subsequent pregnancy. It's important that women who've had a removal of a molar pregnancy are advised not to become pregnant until they have had um, completed their HCG follow-up. So reversible causes, uh, so this is from the maternal, maternal collapse uh, guideline. Um, so the four H's and the four T's for cardiac arrest. So H is for hypovolemia, hypoxia, hypohypokalemia and hyponatremia and hypothermia. Four T's is for um, thromboembolism, toxicity, tension pneumothorax, tamponade um, and uh, eclampsia and preeclampsia can, can also uh, result uh, in cardiac arrest. Uh, which uh, by intracranial hemorrhage. So for hypovolemia, the patient could be bleeding, uh, it could be concealed, uh, or it could be that you can, you know, it's not concealed, um, or it could be um, septic or neurogenic block uh, with dense spinal block. Hypoxia, pregnant women can become hypoxic more quickly. Cardiac events, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, myocardial infarction, aortic dissection, large vessel aneurysm, hypohypokalemia and hyponatremia. Hypo and hypokalemia are no more likely. Hyponatremia may be caused by oxytocin use. Hypothermia is no more likely in a pregnant woman. Thromboembolism, amniotic fluid embolus, um, pulmonary embolus, uh, air embolus, myocardial infarction, toxicity, local anxiety toxicity, magnesium uh, or others, tension pneumothorax following trauma, suicide attempts, tamponade following trauma and suicide attempts, and ecl eclampsia and preeclampsia, as we said, includes intracranial hemorrhage. So physiological and physical changes in pregnancy, so the cardiovascular system, uh, a plasma volume uh, increase up to by 50%. Um, uh, the impact on resuscitation is dilutional anemia, heart rate increases by 15 to 20 beats, increased CPR circulation demand, cardiac output increased by 40%, increased CPR circulation demand, uterine blood flow 10% of cardiac output at a term, um, potential for rapid massive hemorrhage, uh, systemic vascular resistance is decreased, um, sequesters blood during um, CPR, arterial blood pressure um, decreases by 10 to 15 milli, uh, milli, um, millimoles um, of mercury, decreased uh, reserves, venous return is decreased by pressure of gravid uterus on IVC, increased, CP, increased CPR circulation demands um, decreased reserve. Respiratory uh, system, so you've got increased uh, um, uh, rate of, uh, of respiration, um, oxygen is uh, consumption is increased by 20%. Uh, Restful capacity is decreased by 25% because of the effect of the gravid uterus compressing the lung bases. Um, arterial PCO2 is decreased. Laryngeal edema is increased, which results in difficult intubation. Um, gastric mortality is decreased, increased risk of aspiration. 
um, lower esophageal sphincter is relaxed, increased risk of aspiration, the uterus is enlarged, diaph diaphragmatic splinting reduces vestigial capacity and makes ventilation more difficult, iltocaval compression causes supine hypertension, reduces venous return and significantly impairs CPR. Weight increases, large breasts may interfere with intubation, makes ventilation more difficult. Classification of adults according to BMI, so underweight is less than 18.5, normal weight is between 18.5 and 24.99, overweight is more than or equal to 25, pre-obese is between 25 and 29.99, obese class 1 is between 30 and 34.99, obese class 2 is 35 to 39.99, obese class 3 is greater than or equal to 40. So if the patient has a BMI of over 30, 5 milligrams of folic acid is, is recommended uh, to be started at least one month before conception and to continue in the first um, trim trimester of pregnancy. So placenta previa, low-lying placenta, if the placenta is uh, thought to be low-lying, that's less than 20 millimeters from the internal os, or previa, which is completely covering the os, then routine fetal at the routine fetal normally scan, then follow-up ultrasound, especially transvaginal ultrasound, is recommended at 32 weeks of gestation to diagnose uh, a persistent low-lying placenta and or placenta previa. In women with a persistent low-lying placenta or placenta previa, 32 weeks uh, who remain completely asymptomatic, an additional TV ultrasound is recommended. Uh, at around 36 weeks of gestation to inform discussion about mode of delivery. With placenta previa or a low-lying placenta, late preterm, that's between 34 to 36 weeks plus six weeks of gestation, delivery should be considered if it's based on history of vaginal bleeding or any other risk factors for preterm delivery. So, uh, so if a patient does have problems uh, with antepartum hemorrhage or any of the risk factors, then late preterm delivery can be considered. In an uncomplicated placenta previa, delivery should be uh, considered between 36 and 37 plus zero weeks of gestation. Placenta creta, planned delivery between 35 to 36 plus six weeks, uh, balancing between fetal mat maturation and the risk of unscheduled delivery. ECV 8% of primary uh, gravid uh, have a breach at, uh, after 36 weeks of gestation. ECV, if ECV at term has been unsuccessful, 3-7% um, of babies will spontaneously turn to cephalic presentation. Spontaneous reversion to breach after a successful ECV is 3%. HIV in pregnancy, so sexual health uh, screening is recommended for a newly diagnosed uh, um, women with HIV in the pregnancy. If a patient takes this particular antiviral, which is dolotegravir, um, and they're trying to, or trying to conceive or in the first trimester of pregnancy, they should be recommended to take folic acid 5 milligrams once a day. Women who are not on this uh, particular antiviral, that is uh, Dolotec Revere, um, then the standard recommendation of folic acid is uh, 400 micrograms once a day, um, unless they have any other uh, uh, risk factors that mean that they need to take a higher folic acid dose. So um, all women uh, not on uh, any antiretroviral therapy should commence um, antiretroviral therapy um, as soon as they are able to in the second trimester um, where the baseline viral load is less than or equal to 30,000 HIV RNA copies per male. At the start of the second trimester, as soon as possible thereafter, in women with um, baseline uh, viral load of between 30,000 to 100,000 HIV RNA copies per mil. Within the first trimester, if a viral load is over 100,000 HIV RNA copies per mil and or CD4 cell count of less than 200 cells per millimeters of um, millimeter cube, all women should have commenced uh, antiretroviral therapy by week 24 of pregnancy. So model delivery, so if plasma viral load of less than 50 HIV RNA copies per mil at 36 weeks and in the absence of obstetric contraindications, vaginal delivery should be supported. If viral load is over or equal to 400 HIV RNA copies per mil at 36 weeks, pre-labor cesarean section is recommended. VBAC can be offered if the viral load is less than 50 HIV RNA copies per mil. 
viral load is is less than one is, is less than 50 HIV RNA copies per mil. Immediate induction or augmentation of labor is recommended if um, there is pre-labor SHROM uh, with a low threshold for treatment of intrapartum pyrexia. Obstetric management should aim uh, to, uh, for delivery within 24 hours of SHROM. So proposed management of bladder pain syndrome. Um, so you take initial assessment is history taking, um, assess urinary symptoms, pain, quality of life, urine dipstick plus or minus MSU, physical examination, frequency and volume charts. Um, if there is urinary tract infection, then treat and reassess. Um, consider other causes like malignancy, infection, overactive bladder, bladder, um, calculi, bladder outlet obstruction, prolapse, endometriosis, radiation or drug related cystitis. First line treatment uh, conservative is analgesia, stress relief, dietary modification, exercise, physical therapy, uh, support groups. Um, if treatment fails, refer to secondary care. Second line treatment is oral amitriptyline um, or simetidine. If treatment fails, refer to MDT, uh, pain team plus or minus clinical psychologist. Third line is intravesical um, stuff like heparin, botulin, toxin, A, DMSO, lead lidocaine, um, chondroitin um, sulfate or hyaluronic acid. Fourth line is a neuromodulation, posterior tibialin nerve or sacral nerve stimulation, oral cyclosporin A. Fifth line is cystoscopy and uh, hydrodistension. If uh, hunter lesions are noted or if major surgery is considered, refer to tertiary care. PMS, uh, first line is exercise, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, vitamin B6, uh, so that's premenstrual syndrome, um, combined uh, new generation pill, um, continuous or luteal phase, uh, day 15 to 28, low dose SRIs, example, citalo pram or uh, 10 milligrams. Second line is estradiol patches, 100 micrograms plus micronized progesterone, um, uh, orally or vaginally, or um, the, the coil, higher dose SSRIs, uh, continuously or low teal phase, uh, example, citalopram uh, or um, S citalopram, which is 20 to 40 milligrams. Um, third line is GNRH analogs plus add back HRT, um, which is continuous combined estrogen plus progesterone, um, example, 50 to 100 micrograms of estradiol patches or two to four doses of estradiol gel combined with micronized progesterone 100 milligrams per day or tibilone 2.5 milligrams. Fourth line is surgical treatment plus or minus HRT. Lovely. So that's, uh, that brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope that you found uh, the slides very useful. As I've said, um, this uh, info, that these slides contain very, very important and vital information that you must remember for your MRCOG Part 2 exam. Uh, so please make sure that you um, revise uh, all these slides on a regular basis, especially um, the night before the exam. And please like, comment and subscribe to my channel as I would really appreciate this. Um, and also I'll be doing uh, more revision summaries um, so you don't want to miss out on them. Thank you so much for listening.